Welcome back to Purgatorio, the 14th century poem written by Dante Alighieri. In the last episode, our poets walked among the envious, those suffering to purge their souls with harsh lessons of love. In this episode, Dante and Virgil will tackle the third terrace of Purgatory, the Terrace of the Wrathful. The poets have arrived upon the third terrace. Dante moves to thank his mentor for his wisdom on the stairway up, believing it has contented him. He is stopped from doing so, however, because immediately upon arriving, Dante is struck by a series of powerful and ecstatic visions. He sees many people inside of a temple. A woman that Dante describes as having a motherly bearing is entering that temple. She speaks. Behold, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. In the book of Luke, Mary and Joseph were travelling away from Jerusalem for an entire day before they realised that the infant Jesus was not among their group. They returned to Jerusalem and discovered him teaching in a temple. These softly spoken words of Mary ask Jesus, why would you do this to us? They are the tempered tones of what should be a justifiably angry mother. As the words leave Mary's lips, she becomes silent, and the first vision dissolves away. A second image floods into Dante's mind. It is yet another woman, tears streaming down her face from anger. If you are lord of the city, avenge yourself of those impudent arms which have embraced our daughter. The woman is crying out for punishment of a man who, in public, kissed her and the lord of the city's daughter. Her husband calmly fades into the scene, appearing gentle and kind. He answers his wife, asking her what the punishments of those who wish them ill should be if even those that love them are to be condemned. This tale is a reenactment of Pisistratus, a tyrant of Athens well known to be able to soothe wrath with warm speech. In the third and final vision, Dante witnesses a man in his youth being stoned to death by many angry people. They shout that they must destroy him over and over again. They encourage each other to cast the final blow. Even among this, a poet sees the injured man's head peering upwards towards the gates of heaven. He has a look of pity on his face and is praying to God to have mercy on the people currently persecuting and killing him. This is a reflection of the story of Saint Stephen, the first martyr of Christianity and one of the seven deacons appointed by the apostles. These three examples, the whip of this terrace, are demonstrations of meekness. Meekness is kind of like gentleness in the face of strength. It is a virtue of moderating one's own power for the sake of peace, even when confronted with the aggressions of others. The immediate introduction of this terrace's whip still conforms to Dante's thematic template of purgatory, the first example here being from the life of Mary. After the last vision falls away, Dante attempts to regain his composure in the real world. He thinks that he was as if dreaming, but of real things. When my soul turned from these appearances to things which are true independently of itself, I recognized my errors, which were not falsehoods. During his escapades, Dante had now fallen a slight way behind his mentor. Virgil turns, seeing that Dante is in a condition of a man waking up and ridding himself of slumber. What is the matter? Why aren't you keeping up? Virgil then asks how Dante managed to walk half a league on this terrace with his eyes shut and legs staggering about, like a man in a drunken stupor. Our poet begins to reply, readying the tale of what just happened, but is quickly interrupted by his mentor. If you had a hundred masks upon your face, still your smallest cognition would not be closed to me. Virgil can easily read Dante's thoughts, He doesn't need to say a thing. Virgil explains Dante's visions to him, that these images are pushed into Dante's head to stop him closing himself off to the virtue of meekness. The visions force Dante to embrace the waters of peace that trickle down from God's love, or as Virgil calls it here, the eternal fountain. Going back to his original question of what is the matter, 
Virgil says that he didn't ask this for the sake of understanding Dante's ailment. He did this simply to shake Dante awake and to move his feet to attention and purpose. We were going through the evening with our eyes straining to see as far ahead as possible in the face of bright evening sunlight. Little by little a smoke came towards us as dark as night with no escape. It took from us the clear air and our sight. A great dark fog has approached and enwrapped our poets. Dante eloquently describes the completeness of it, noting its blackness in comparison with other extremely dark places. If one were in the darkest parts of hell, he says, were out at night with no stars in the sky, shadowed by as much cloud as there could be, it would still not compare to the deep veil now surrounding him. Dante finds that he is struggling to keep his eyes open in the deep fog. He finds that the now dirty, foul-tasting air is prickling at his flesh and harshly stinging his eyes. Virgil steps closer to his charge. He offers his shoulder as an anchor for our poet to hold on to. Virgil leads him as one leads a blind man the sightless stepping cautiously for things that may be hazardous. Take care that you do not get cut off from me. The pair are stumbling through the terrace when voices start to appear from inside the fog. Our poets can hear prayers of peace and mercy directed at Jesus. Every prayer starts with Agnus Dei or Lamb of God, a title for Jesus first seen in the book of John. As each prayer begins, the voices speak these words with the same intonation and tone performing it in absolute harmony. Dante questions his mentor as to if these voices are spirits, nearby and among them. Virgil responds that these unseen shades are currently loosening the bonds of wrath. The third terrace is dedicated to the wrathful, those without meekness. Their punishment is to ceaselessly wander around in this terrible stinging black fog. Along their path, they are forcefully struck with visions to purge their souls of wrath. The whip and the bridle of this terrace are all the souls are able to witness as they walk, for as their wrath inescapably blinded them in life, this fog now blinds them in death. And who are you who cut through our smoke, and who speaks of us as if you still measure time by the divisions of a calendar? The words come from one of the voices residing within the fog. Virgil urges his companion to speak to the voice and ask for the correct path forwards. Dante calls out into the black. He entices the spirit to walk with them, promising a great tale if he does. The voice replies, confirming only that he will follow along as much as he is allowed to. He says that, because of the fog, they will likely have to remain in contact by conversation alone. Our poet regales the spirit in the fog with his story, talking of his journey as a living man passing through the realms of hell and, if God permits, to the spheres of heaven. With this bundle which death unties, I go on the upwards journey. Dante implores the soul to identify himself and to give directions to the correct road. The penitent accommodates. As an added comment, he is sure to also note that people these days have a deficient drive to being virtuous. I was a Lombard, and I was called Marco. I knew about the world, and what I valued were things that no one aims at anymore. To go higher, you must go straight on. I beg you pray for me when you are higher. This penitent, that we will call Marco Lombardo, is a fairly mysterious character in Purgatorio. It's difficult to lock down who Marco actually was in real life, if he ever was a real person at all. The result of this being, we know next to nothing about him. He is sometimes identified as a nobleman in the Venetian Lombardi family. He could be associated with the same Marco Lombardo named in Novellino, a popular series of Tuscan prose anecdotes at the time. He could have been a man named Marco from Lombardy, or a knight in a family called Lombardo. Marco's invectives against Italy, and his upcoming commentary on named nobility, could arguably be used to evidence that he himself was a contemporary of that nobility, but we may never know the full truth. In any case, our poet would have, no doubt, expected his readers to know who this man was. Dante tells Marco 
that there is a growing doubt within him, and if he doesn't express it, it will burst. It is a doubt which has been compounded by both Marco's own statement just a moment ago and the words of Guido del Duca on the last terrace. The world is devoid of virtue and is now flooded with malice. Dante believes this to be true, yet doesn't know why the world has become this way. He says that some believe this state of being to be the will of heaven and others an effect of the actions of men. He implores Marco to explain it, for if Marco tells him the cause, then he can tell that cause to others. Marco begins with a deep and exasperated sigh. Brother, the world is blind. You who are living attribute all causes to the heavens above, as if everything there is responsible. If it were so, that would mean the destruction of your free will. Marco continues that if free will is nullified, then there would be no justice for the wicked and no reward for the virtuous. Heaven only initiates things and only influences human desires. People have the lights to distinguish right from wrong themselves and their intelligence and will is not subject to heavenly influence. How people choose to follow their path is purely of their own volition and wisdom. So if the present world is going off course, then the reason is in you and should be sought there. The penitent describes that on its creation, a soul is like a newborn baby, weeping, laughing and childish. It knows nothing except the first influences of God moving it to glad desires. The soul turns to whatever brings it joy, finding delights in earthly goods. However, it is inexperienced and cannot yet tell which of those goods are deceptive and which ones are truly good, at least not without guidance. Without guides and curbs, or bridles and whips, the soul can fall into a pattern of twisted love, constantly reaching for the wrong objects of gladness. For this reason, the penitent says, laws exist, and kings and queens exist to apply those laws. Marco begins to pull the conversation back to why Italy is in such a dire state. He says the Pope does not lead his flock like a good shepherd should, claiming authority over the earthly and the spiritual, with greed for things that he has no authority over. The followers of the Pope drive for the same desires as their guiding leader, who misconducts them, taking them on a stagnated path to twisted love. This section, arguing free will over strict determinism, is a very important part of the entire Divine Comedy. The conversation with Marco sits right in the middle of all three parts of the poem, presenting that Dante's tale is, at its literal heart, a tale of justice, made possible through free will. It's a poem about people given what they justly deserve, dictated by the choices that they freely made themselves. Dante is presenting here that, because divine reward and punishment exists, because a person's ultimate fate is decided by their good or evil actions, free will must therefore be unconstrained by heaven. Without free will, there would be no way to distinguish those in hell or heaven as good and evil would be arbitrarily assigned. Condemning some or rewarding others without free will would therefore be unjust. Justice as a theme has actually permeated Dante's comedy since the very beginning. The words on the gate of hell state, justice is what moved my exalted maker. In hell we also see the idea of perfect justice, with punishments mirroring or balancing the crimes themselves. In purgatory the theme of justice continues. When the New Island penitents fled from Cato's outburst, Dante goes on to call the mountain a place where people are ransacked by justice. Purgatory is a place of whips and bridles to better conduct souls into freely reaching for the correct sources of joy and therefore act more justly. We even see justice itself feeding into those whips. We saw Emperor Trajan moved by justice to help the grieving woman on the Terrace of Pride, or, in the visions a moment ago, Pisistratos considering if the punishment of his daughter's love would be just. To tie back to Marco's usage of inexperienced free will as a drive to twisted love, this also applies to Dante. Inferno was a place where pity on souls was seen as a lack of understanding and therefore unjust. Dante was conducted to the correct learning by Virgil, 
freely acting more just over time. In Purgatory, much the same is happening, as Dante learns more and more that people are exactly where they are supposed to be. Those in hell deserve to be in hell. Those in heaven deserve to be in heaven. Marco explains that at this moment it is not so much the evil of people as it is the evil of bad governance presently leading people astray in Italy. The penitent speaks of Rome, that it used to have two sons, one to conduct the people on roads of the world and one to guide the roads towards God. When the Pope decided to do both, it's not really surprising that things began to fall apart. He explains the conflicting hybridization of the powers and how they can often be confused. He then quotes the book of Matthew with a biblical reference that speaks of wolves in sheep's clothing and false prophets. One has put out the other, and the sword is combined with a crook. The two held together. One does not fear the other. By their fruits you shall know. The penitent continues. He talks about the river Adige and Po running through Lombardy. Before Emperor Frederick II was hindered by the Pope, Lombardy was a land of courage and courtesy. Nowadays, any malicious man can walk in safety, comforted in the knowledge that they will not come across anyone virtuous enough to avoid. Marco does concede that there are three elderly men, still virtuous, that refuse these evil societal changes. For them, it feels like a long age waiting for God to improve their circumstances. Their mention here calls back to the previous terrace and continues Guido del Duca's theme on generational degeneracy. First is Corrado da Palazzo from Brescia. Then is Gerardo da Camino, also known as the Good Gerardo, from Padua. Finally is Guido da Castello, also known as the straightforward Lombard, from Reggio Emilia. The penitent puts it to Dante that as the Pope now confuses power, the church stumbles and falls into the mud, dirtying itself and the load it carries. Our poet replies that Marco has laid out his arguments very well. He continues that he now understands why Jewish priests, the sons of Levi, were denied inherited access to earthly goods. Dante asks Marco who the good Gerardo is, the example of the bygone virtuous generation who proves the degeneracy of the day. The penitent asks if Dante is trying to trick him or tempt him. Dante is speaking in Tuscan, there's no way he hasn't heard of this person. He tells our poet that he knows Gerardo by no other surname and that he can only discover it from Gerardo's daughter, Gaia. Goodbye now. I may proceed no further with you. See the angel's light which streams through the smoke. I must go before I appear to him. Marco then turns and leaves our poets to their task. Dante speaks to the reader directly, asking us to use our imagination. He tells us to think of a time we were walking over a mountain with a heavy mist slowly fading away. He asks us to think of the light of the sun re-emerging through that mist. This is how Dante says he feels as the black stinging veil is drawn back and the sunlight reaches his face. So keeping my steps with the trusted steps of my master, I came out of that cloud when the sun was already dead on the low shore. Continuing his thoughts into imagination, our poet ponders the nature of imagination itself. He wonders if imagination could exist without the senses, and if so, what then would drive it? He thinks heaven, perhaps, or maybe it would be free will. This is a profound concept that Dante is pondering, especially relevant now after just travelling through a sense-depriving blackness where imagination is the power of the realm. As if on cue, Dante suddenly snaps into another series of powerful visions. The bridal exemplifying wrath is on its way. First, Dante sees a nightingale fly through the air, recognizing it as her who changed her form into the bird that most delights to sing. Our poet says that he can focus on nothing else but the bird. This bird is likely a reference to the Greek mythical character of Procne. The tale goes, that Princess Philomela of Athens travelled to Thrace to visit her sister Procne and Procne's husband, King Terius. King Terius's lust was great, and he quickly ushered Philomela out to a cabin in the woods where he forced himself upon her. When Philomela refused to keep silent afterwards, the king cut out her tongue. 
she managed to defy him still by fashioning a rope for Procne inscribed with the truth. Procne was so enraged with wrath that she butchered her own and the king's son. After this, she had the king unknowingly eat his son's remains. When the king discovered what had been done, he chased the two sisters with an axe. The gods heard their pleas and, to assist their escape, transformed Philomela into a swallow and Procne into a nightingale. The first image of wrath dissolves away. Dante next sees a man crucified, dying yet full of fury and ferocity. Beside him is King Ahasuerus, his wife Esther, and the blameless and just Mordecai. The angry man in question here is Haman the Evil, the vizier of Persia. In the Book of Esther, Mordecai refuses to kneel to Haman. The vizier reacts by ordering all of the Jews in the kingdom, including Mordecai, to be killed. Esther is King Ahasuerus' new wife. She foils this plot as she is herself Jewish. She tells her husband what is happening and that Haman wants to have her killed. Haman is crucified by the king. The second image breaks away. This time Dante says it is much like a bubble bursting when its thin veil is ripped by water. A girl appears in the next vision. She is speaking out in grief. Oh queen, why through anger did you kill yourself? You killed yourself so as not to lose me, but now you have lost me. It is I who mourn for your ruin instead of the ruin of another. The third and final image is of Lavinia, who mourns her mother Emeta after she killed herself. In Virgil's Aeneid, Emeta refused Aeneas's offer of marriage to her daughter. Lavinia was already betrothed to King Taunus. Emeta instigated a bloody conflict between Aeneas and Taunus over the hand of Lavinia. When Emeta believed that Taunus was killed thanks to her actions, she hung herself in anger. Dante describes he is waking up like a man shaken by the first light of morning, striking against closed eyes. So what I was imagining collapsed as soon as my face was struck by a light greater than any we were accustomed to. Dante turns around to see where he is and a voice speaks out to him. It is here you come up. All other thoughts leave Dante at the sound of the voice. Our poet has a great desire to see the being who spoke. Its head is embedded in light. He concentrates hard, trying to see the face to match the voice. However, he finds that just as his eyes are deficient at seeing the brilliantly bright sun and perceiving the sun's true image, so is his vision also deficient here. That is a divine spirit who shows us the way up without waiting to be asked. It conceals itself within its own light. Now let our feet follow the invitation. Let us try to climb before it grows dark, for then it will not be possible until the day returns. Virgil and Dante begin their ascent towards the next terrace. As Dante reaches the first step, a fluttering movement of wings flies past his face, carrying with it a flowing gust of wind. The air is followed up by a voice speaking the words Beati Pacifici, or Blessed are the Peacemakers. Another P has been removed from Dante's head. Already, the last rays, which are followed by night, had risen so far above us that the stars made themselves seen in many directions. With the oncoming night approaching, Dante feels his legs beginning to lose their power. This strange loss of strength harkens back to the lesson of nighttime will that Sordello taught our poets. Dante reaches the final step and can move no further, imagining himself like a ship berthed on the shore. He and Virgil have arrived at the fourth terrace of purgatory, the Terrace of the Slothful. That's it, thanks for watching this episode. We've recently got back into social media here on the channel, so check out our social links in the description for more history content. We've also started up a Patreon where we regularly post behind the scenes content. If you fancy supporting our work, please check that out. As always, I'll catch you in the next episode. Toodles.